You know, I think one of the best examples is demand forecasting. Okay. And demand forecasting has been around for a long time, right? And retailers do it at different levels. Some retailers are still back in Excel figuring that out, and, and they have a lot of art. Uh, other retailers have gotten more sophisticated and have acquired some, some very um, powerful products. But a lot of those um, are antiquated, and there's been a lot of advancements in artificial intelligence and machine learning. And one of the cool things about the approach that we've taken with demand forecasting is that we understand that different products have different profiles and require different algorithms. And so we, we match up the right algorithm to the right product, whether it's seasonal or non-seasonal or whatever, um, to figure out what the best demand forecast is. So as, as a great example, we've been working with uh, the Very Group in the UK. Are you guys familiar with them? Yes. They're, they're huge, right? Um, one of the largest e-commerce um, vendors in the UK. And um, they came to us and said, hey, we want to improve our demand forecasting. And so we ran something like 70 different experiments with them, creating something like 8 million forecasts, right, to really tune this thing and figure out how to make it work best. And the end result was we delivered about a 9.9% .9 improvement in SKU management, resulting in about 110 million pounds of savings just through uh, implementing a new version of demand forecasting. So there's a lot of low hanging fruit still out there just by updating to the latest technology. David, I, as a former demand forecaster, the one thing that I always question though on, on this, because you hear this use case a lot, you know, Anna and I've talked about this use case a lot, is how do you actually measure the impact of it to the point where you have a degree of confidence that it's working? Because there's so many things in retail that can impact how inventory is moving. You know, it could be, you could be selling a product that's just a, capturing the trend at a period of time, for example, or, you know, the the price might be, you know, more right or more promotional at a given period of time. So how do you how do you think about that? Or as you're talking with retailers that are going through these implementations, how do you give them the confidence that they are knowing that the investment is paying off? Yeah, a lot of times what we do are we do a lot of back testing. So we say, here's the forecast. And had we um, have used this other forecast, we'll back test it and then we'll compare the two and see which one works out better. Okay. Sometimes we have to pull out things like promotional lift or weather phenomena, things like right. that could impact your demand forecast just to clean it up and, and make it an apples to apples comparison. And that's why it took us all these experiments to get this right, right? So you're, you're trying different things, you're trying different algorithms just to tune it and just get it right for your product catalog. Got it. Got it. Uh, Filippo, let's bring you in here. Do you agree with David on, on the the assessment of demand forecasting being an immediate place to impact profitability? Yeah, demand forecasting has a lot of potentials in terms of the application of AI in uh, in retail. You have to think like a company like Vary, for instance, they have like about half a million SKUs at any moment in time. So it's really important for them to use all the information that they have available, whether in-house or external factors to be able to uh, to compute that kind of uh, forecasting capabilities that really helps them to streamline operation. Um, maybe another uh, application of, of AI, and in particular of generative AI that we saw, retailers are already uh, investing in it and are already implementing is um, generative AI for product description. Again, it's something that especially in e-commerce, uh, you know, e-commerce retailers, they have uh, uh, a lot of SKUs at all time and uh, they really need to uh, ensure a consistency in terms of uh, product description. So that's really useful to have a tool like Generative AI to create the, the same level of product information for all the range of products that retailers can sell. Mm. Yeah, you know, on that, um, we have a, a customer that went through that very um, use case. This customer was a West Coast, West Coast retailer that was importing a lot of products from China. And so the, the product descriptions were very scant. Um, so like you get things like bicycle. Right, right. right. <laughs> if you're lucky, probably too, yeah. right? Yeah, right. right. Yeah, so, so not very good, right? So what right. we did is we used generative AI with this um, retailer to be able to take the image that came with it and we, we use um, generative AI to pull out the attributes from that image and then collect a bunch of attributes about that product. We take whatever product description they gave, gave us. And then the third ingredient there is the product voice or the brand voice, right? So the, for example, the Target brand voice is very different than a Walmart brand voice. And so yes. you, want, you want your descriptions to be in that right voice. So we used all that information to generate product descriptions. They said it would take between one and two weeks 
for them to get a new product up on the website before this, after it took one to two days at most. Because we would generate such a good product description, we always still have human in the loop, so the copywriters would still go in there and make the tweaks that they wanted, but that really, really sped the process up. Getting those yeah. products on the web allowed them to sell sooner and make more money. Well, David, you kind of got me thinking too about like how that then can uh, impact like things like personalization. I mean, is that something that you're seeing a lot? We hear that a lot too. Like AI is helping these creative teams come up with, you know, six different versions or even getting further down the line. Is that something that you're seeing is paying off for retailers that you've worked with? Oh yeah, absolutely. So okay. uh, one example is a luxury department store retailer that we were working with had decided to do an email campaign with product recommendations using personalization. Pretty standard, great, yeah. right? very low click through, just they weren't getting any traction with it. So this luxury retailer um, has a lot of store uh, associates that know the customers. And so they had them write emails to make the product uh, product recommendations. And so they, they used the store staff to actually create emails that went out to their best customers. And they got a great click through rate. But here's the problem. That's very labor intensive. Yeah, <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. That's, <laughs> that's what you need those 1,000 interns. Especially when you work at a store. <laughs> yeah, that's you need right. those 1,000 interns for that. You need those 1,000 interns. So we apply Gen AI to that. So we take the product recommendation. We take a lot of the information about the customer and do hyper-personalization to create a very engaging email. And then we use the store staff just to check over that email. Human in the loop. Make a few, few tweaks here and there, and that's it saves them tons of time, still has that personalization from the human touch and from the information we have, and their click-through rates went up. Good click-through rates, low labor usage. It's a win-win. And those are, those are the...